Welcome back. This is our second lecture in post-classical period, the spread of Islam. So in the first lecture, we talked about how Islam grew and spread in Southwest Asia. These set of notes are going to talk about the spread of Islam into South and Southeast Asia. And we're going to see these two very distinct cultures and religions come together. On the right hand side we see a, a symbol for Hinduism which has thousands of gods, polytheistic in many ways, um, and then how does it interact with the spread of Islam that we see on the left which is a monotheistic faith. And does that cause conflict? Does that cause cultural diffusion and accommodation? We will find out. So post-classical northern India. So we're going to start about 600 um, CE or AD uh, and so at the start of period three, we're going to see that India is highly decentralized. After the fall of the Gupta Empire in period two, India had reverted back to its normal state of affairs, which was to be very decentralized, rules, ruled by local rajas or local kings. Until we get to around 600, 606, at the very start of the time period, we're going to see a new power rise up in northern India, and it's going to provide temporary civilization. And this is King Harsha's empire. We can see that it's there in northern India, continuing a trend that we've seen on and off throughout South Asian history, is that if South Asia becomes centralized under one empire, it's usually only northern India. Um, we're going to see that people repeatedly will be able to centralize by using control of the Ganges River that flows from uh, west to east in northern India um, and then some extent off and on also the Indus River and so being able to control certainly the Ganges allows somebody to control trade and build up an empire and so King Harsha is able to unite northern India um, and we see that it'll last about 40 years now as he, as he unites all these local Raj under, under a centralized rule he understands that India is a land of uh, hundreds of different gods, uh, many different religions, whether they be Hindu or Buddhist. And so he cannot say that I'm going to use one faith to unite India, because then he'd have religious strife and civil wars on his hand, on his hands. And so he is very tolerant of all faiths um, in his kingdom because he doesn't want to create this internal rebellion. However, he is a Buddhist himself, and what he will try to do is he'll try to promote Buddhism to unify his people. It would be much easier to rule if everybody was the same faith, but as we just said, he doesn't want to force everybody to do that. One, that's not what Buddhists believe in, forcing people to believe in their faith. And two, it would cause all kinds of religious conflict with the Hindu population. Um, and so he's a very tolerant uh, empire. Uh, next, administration. As you can imagine, if you're trying to centralize a part of the world that is not normally centralized South Asia, it's going to be very hard to do this. Um, and we've talked about how other empires around the world have done this, whether it was the Zhou putting their friends and family in charge of provinces, or the Han using an educated bureaucracy, or the Romans using a bureaucratic reward system. Here in Harsha's kingdom, he is going to basically spend his entire reign on horseback, traveling around from regional kingdom to regional kingdom, checking up on the local Raja, making sure that they're forwarding their taxes and tribute, um, making sure that they're following the laws and being tolerant, um, that kind of thing. It's interesting that at the same time period, just a couple hundred years later in Europe, we have talked about this uh, in a different set of notes, that King Charlemagne in Central Europe, Western and Central Europe, is going to administer his state in much the same way, riding around on horseback, keeping uh, tabs on all of the, the local rulers that he's let stay in power. He's also going to promote education and scholarship. He believes that the more educated people you have in your empire, the more bureaucrats you'd be able to depend on to help um, you know, rule the state, the more merchants you'll have uh, who can read and write, and that'll increase trade. And so again, another parallel that we see with Charlemagne, during both of their rules, education and literacy went up, as, so, as well as trade. Now, unlike, Hart, unlike Charlemagne, he is going to try to provide free health care to his people as well. Again, he understands the basic rule that happy people equal long-lasting dynasty. If the peasants are happy, the people have no reason to rebel. They're taken care of health-wise. They can have their own faith. The taxes remain fairly low. Um, people are going to be content. Long-lasting dynasty. And so these are all the things that he tries to do. And unfortunately, his dynasty does not last as long as he would have liked. Um, we see that later after Harsha 
uh, his empire falls because that's just not the normal state of affairs in India. When Harsh is not there to keep the empire together anymore, without this charismatic leader, it starts to fall apart. And then we'll fast forward a little bit until we get to the 8th century. And in 711, we're going to see the Umayyads, who we've talked about in our first set of notes. The Umayyads come in and they will conquer um, parts of uh, northwestern India. Uh, they're here because they're looking for plunder, not so much to spread their faith, but certainly to um, pillage and plunder and get wealthy off of their conquests. In addition to that, the Umayyad Empire knows that in order to get wealthy, not only can you get it by stealing things from people, but also if you promote trade, you can tax that trade. And so we see that India is going to be brought into the Muslim world through uh, being conquered, but also being now cut, tied into their trade networks. Under the Umayyad rule, very few Indians convert. Um, that's not what the Umayyads are primarily there for, and so there's not this emphasis by the Umayyad Empire, the Umayyad state, to force people to convert um, to their faith. So that's one reason that not a lot of people convert. Um, next, it's very hard to bridge the gap between Hinduism and Islam. Hinduism is a polytheistic faith. You can, certainly can look at it that way, and you have all these different gods um, and all these different dharmas, these ways to get to salvation. And Islam has one. Islam has one God, and the, the path primarily is through Muhammad. Um, and so these two religions clash. So it's very hard when a new religion comes in, it's hard to replace that older religion if they're so different. There's just not enough similarities to make it easy for a group of people to give up their faith and come to a new faith. Next. The Umayyads are not really interested in administration. They're more about conquering, as we've talked about in our first set of Islam notes. And so they're perfectly content to leave the local rajas in charge, which works in India. I mean, whether it's the Gupta Empire or Harsha's Empire, they're centralized, sort of. Uh, they are centralized, but they are able to keep things functioning in this very diverse place called India by letting the local Rajas stay in charge. And so there's no incentive there. If the Mayads would have come in and said, look, the only people that can be in charge are Muslims, maybe the elite Hindus and South Asians would have like, well, I'll convert then if that's the path to being in charge. But when you let the local Rajas stay in charge, then there's no incentive to convert. I can stay who I am, I can be Hindu, or I can stay Buddhist, and then I can stay in charge. There's no reason to drop my faith and embrace a new one. There are Muslims, though, besides the conquering armies that come in. Um, there are Muslim merchants that come in, and this is a great example of diasporic communities. Communities of people that are living a long ways away from their homeland, but they insist um, on tradition and carrying out their beliefs, even though they're a stranger in a strange land. Um, and so we see these diaspora communities of Muslim merchants primarily living in and among Buddhists and Hindus um, and continuing to practice their faith. Now that, over time, will lead to more con con conversion. It takes a while. Um, but we will see that if I'm in a diaspora Muslim community in India, um, I have a son or a daughter, and they may fall in love with somebody in the Hindu or Buddhist community. And I will say, well, if you want to marry my kid, you have to convert. And so some people start to convert a little bit because of interaction and marriage. Um, in addition to that, as we saw, we're going to see in Africa... Um, in our third and final set of notes about the spread of Islam, we're going to see that merchants, if I'm a Hindu merchant and I want to trade with some of these Muslim merchants coming in and living in these aspect communities, they might be more likely to trade with me if I also convert to Islam. They might be able to convert, um, they might trade with me more than my competitor down the road who stays Hindu. And so we do see some merchants um, converting to Islam during the rule of the Umayyad, but again, it's a very gradual thing. Next, another reason that we don't see mass conversion is because the Muslims, when they come in under the Umayyads, they realize that they have to get along with the Hindu population. The Hindus are the majority population, and there's millions of them, and if we were to try to say, convert or die, um, you would have a full-scale rebellion on your hand, and you'd probably get kicked out, and that would be expensive, and you'd lose the control. And so they protect Hindus, and they say that Hindus are people of the book. Hindus have the Rig Veda, and the Upanishads, and other religious texts, um, and so they say, well, just like Jews and Christians and Muslims, they have 
have a religious book. They pray to a god. There's a lot of them. So we're not going to we're not going to kill them. We'll just have them pay a tax, just like Jews pay a tax, just like Christians pay a tax, just like many Muslims pay a tax. But this is the the jizya that we've talked about in our last set of notes, the religious tax um, that we have conquer people continue to pay. Um, as a way for them to support the government, but also as a way for them to be able to keep their faith under government supervision. So all of those were reasons why people don't convert in mass numbers. Then what we're going to see is a second wave of Muslim invasions come in in 962. This is not the Umayyad dynasty. This is a different group of Muslims. These are people who are Muslim, but ethnically Turk. Now, the Turks are a nomadic group of people that come from Central Asia, and they're a conquering people. Um, and they have converted to Islam through conquest and trade with the Umayyads. Um, and so they are looking for new places to go and gain wealth and gain power. And so the Umayyad dynasty is gone, and it's weakened, um, and it's been replaced by the Abbasid dynasty. Um, and so we see that Umayyad rule in India is tenuous and not it's not really holding on. And so this is a great opportunity for these Muslims, these Muslim Turks to come in. And so Mahmoud of Ghazni is going to come in and he is going to bring this, uh, what we call the horde of his Central Asian uh, warrior nomads that are very good warriors. And they come in and they will, just like the Umayyads, look for plunder. So another wave of plunder coming in. Um, however, they're a little bit different here, is they notice that the Buddhist population of South Asia is a minority. Um, and they also notice that, uh, that under Mahayana Buddhism, one could help attain salvation by giving money to a monastery. And so these Buddhist monasteries were very wealthy, and the Buddhist monks had taken vows of nonviolence. And so this is very attractive. If I'm, a, if I'm a conqueror coming in, I can target these Buddhist monasteries. I can easily take them over because the monks are pacifists um, and they have lots of wealth. And so because of this, a long-term consequence of this uh, invasion by Mahmud of Ghazni and the Turks is that Buddhism will almost disappear in northern India. Um, there'll be such targets of these invasions that Buddhism, which is homeland, is India, will almost be wiped out, and we're really only going to find Buddhism in um, Central Asia and Southeast Asia and East Asia, um, where it's spread to. So that's a long-term conflict, or a long-term uh, consequence. Um, in addition to that, we see this is very similar to when Vikings invaded. At the same time, when Vikings are invading Western Europe, they were attracted to Christian monasteries for the same reason. Christians had donated money and land and gold and silver, etc., to monasteries as a way to attain salvation. Um, and the monks had taken vows of, of peacefulness, nonviolence, and so this was an easy target for them as well. Then one final long-term consequence of Mahmud of Ghazni's invasion is that here's another language that is going to spread. We have talked about how Arabic is going to spread throughout the, um, the Muslim world um, from Spain all the way to India, but also these Turkish people when they start invading, as we will see throughout this whole time period, their language is going to come with them. And so this is another example of a language spreading in period three due to conquest and trade, the, the Turkish language. Next, let's fast forward a little bit more from 1206 to 1527. So through the end of period three and actually even into period four, we see another Muslim, not invasion this time, but a state that will be built up um, after the Muslim invasions. And it's a Muslim state. It's called the Sultanate of Delhi, obviously headquartered in Delhi in northern India. And so they are going to maintain Islamic rule of northern India. Um, so we'll also see, and so we see that they will be a little bit centralized, um, and so we see that the Muslims now have established control, um, and in, in this empire, it is something you want to do to convert, because in order to reach the upper echelons of uh, the Sultanate of Delhi society, one must really convert to Islam, and so invasions will start, or I'm sorry, conversions will start to pick up a little bit as we go through the time period. Um, important things that the Sultanate of Delhi does, big picture, is that they're going to hold off Mongol invasions. Later on, at the very end of this unit of period three, we're going to talk about Genghis Khan and cent more Central Asian invasions. Um, and since we have this large, powerful, centralized state of the Sultanate of Delhi, when the Mongols are invading, they won't be able to take India because the Sultanate of Delhi will have coalesced power, centralized power, and is able to create enough organization, a big enough army to keep out the Mongols. However, eventually the Sultanate of Delhi will fall. 
for another wave of Central Asian nomads, and this is going to be Tamerlane. He comes in, um, he is a Central Asian nomad invader, and he will able to control and take over the Sultanate of Delhi as it's weakening in uh, the 16th. 7th, the 16th century of the 1500s. So let's talk about why conversions will steadily increase as we go through period three. Remember I said when the Umayyads come in, not a lot of conversions, but by the time we get to the end of the period, oh, about half-ish of the people in northern India will have converted to Islam. Um, and so we'll have about an equal share of the population of Hindu and Muslim. And so why does that happen? Well, I have already touched on it a little bit when we talked about these diaspora communities. Trade is going to help increase the spread of Islam. Because as Muslim merchants come in um, from the Silk Roads, or they come in from Southwest Asia, or they're maritime merchants on the Indian Ocean trade, we're going to see that if, if they have plenty of goods that they want to trade, and if I'm a Hindu merchant, I know they'll be more likely to trade with me if I convert than if not. And so we see that, again, um, Islam is certainly going to start in cities and then spread out from there into the countryside of India. Next, we had already talked about these diaspora communities leading to marriage conversions over time, and that is just going to continue to go on as the population, if the Muslim population continues to increase, 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 we'll see more trade um, causing a conversion and also more marriages causing conversion. But also, with the loss of Buddhism, if your temple has been destroyed, either now you have no place to pray, um, or you think that Buddhism wasn't all that great anyway because the Muslims' god was able to take over Buddhism. Um, and so there's a void there for people's faith. And Islam is able to slide in to some extent and take over this, this group of people who are searching for something that is more powerful, more meaningful, um, that they can go and pray at because their Buddhist monastery and Buddhist monks have disappeared. And here's primarily, maybe the primary reason that Islam will spread in India, is that it appeals to the lower castes. In India, uh, if you're a shudra, or if you're lower than that, um, or uh, you know, you're a merchant or an artisan, you're in the bottom half of the caste structure. The elite, the, the Brahmin priests, and the, the kshatriya, or the, the warrior caste, they're the ones that have always been in charge. And according to Hinduism and, and samsara reincarnation, that people must work their way up from life to life, building up good karma, and eventually they'll move up into the upper class in their future lives, and eventually they'll attain salvation after they become a Brahmin priest um, and live a, a good life after that. But that's many lives from now. Maybe that's thousands of lives from now. So if I'm a lower caste person... That's something I don't like about Hinduism, this concept of reincarnation and it taking forever, maybe thousands of lifetimes for me to attain salvation. Because when Islam comes in, it says that everybody is equal in the eyes of Allah. Everybody can attain salvation in this life. When you die, you could go to heaven right away and not have to be reincarnated and reincarnated. And so this gives elevated social status um, and opportunities to people in the lower class um, caste, and so they will be more willing to convert. And so we see Islam certainly appealing to the lower caste, and that is most of the people in India. Most of the people are poor, um, and so this is going to have a very wide appeal, and more and more people will convert. Here's another reason we're going to see the spread of more Islam into South Asia is Sufis. Now, in our first set of notes on the spread of Islam, we talked about these Sufis. Sufis are a sect of Islam, and they are mystical. Um, they believe in a more personal, spiritual relationship with Allah. Um, and so as they go out, they're kind of like missionaries, if you want to think of it this way, of Islam. And they will go out into India, and they will preach... Um, how much spirituality they have as a Muslim, that they can feel a lot in their lives. And people who are going through tough times, whether they're poor, or they've been invaded, or their crop failed, or their child is starving or dying from some disease, people want to know that there is a God out there who cares for them and will will connect with them and have a close personal relationship with them. And so people... Um, will convert because of the efforts of Sufis telling people how great Islam is and how it's a very spiritual faith. Um, Sufis also say that they have magical, um, mystical healing powers. And so, again, if my kid is sick, I go to a Sufi mystic and I say, why don't you come to my house? And he, he does his rituals and my child gets better. Of course I'm going to convert because he's just proven the power of his God. And so we see that these Sufis 
are great ambassadors for Islam. Now, very few people actually become Sufis themselves because it's a very ascetic sect. You have to give up a lot, but they but they will convert to Islam, maybe not Sufi Islam, but Sunni Islam, which is the more broader uh, appealing uh, is, is sect of Islam for in the world today, um, and certainly at that time as well. And then we see, just like Christianity spreading or Buddhism spreading, um, if this person comes in, this monk comes in, whether they be Christian, Buddhist, or Muslim, this Sufi, um, and you live a very ascetic life, you don't abuse things, um, you don't uh, overindulge things, you seem like a very pious person, people will start to respect you, even if they're not your faith, and over time they get to know you, and they see, wow, if this person is such a good person, maybe their faith is good too. And so, like I said, they're good ambassadors for Islam. And then finally, we see that Sufis also will help establish schools or madrasas um, to help spread their faith. Um, a few Sufis even create armies to help spread their faith um, to you know, force people to convert. But for the most part, it's these other things that make people convert um, that we have talked about the spirituality, um, the filling the gap left by Islam, I'm sorry, left by Buddhism going away, and of course the appeal to the lower caste. So for all of these reasons, um, we see that Islam becomes more and more and more a part of the tradition of South Asia in period three. So what does Hinduism do in response to this? Um, do the Hindus just all convert? And of course the answer is no. Um, and so how is Hinduism impacted by the spread of Islam? Of course, many Hindus reject it because they say that there are many gods and many dharmas, many paths of salvation. Um, but some Hindus, even though they don't convert, they do like aspects of Islam. And I have said in previous lectures that cultural diffusion, where two cultures come together, is kind of like a buffet. You put on your tray what you like and you reject what you don't. And so we see that this focus on one particular God, this God that you can have a connection with in spirituality, that's very appealing to Hindus. And so they take that aspect of Islam and they make it part of Hinduism. And from this we get these things called um, these cults that are, quote unquote, these cults that are devotional cults. That I'm going to pick one god, maybe Shiva or Vishnu, and I'm going to just worship that god and not the all the other gods, and I'm going to devote myself to them, and now I feel a connection with that god. I've made them special to me, and they are going to make me special to them. And so we see that th this devotional aspect to Hinduism is somewhat of a new phenomenon, and it is going to continue to grow. And so that's an example of this cult cultural diffusion, um, Islam rubbing off on Hinduism. Perhaps the most famous devotional cult at this time is the Bhakti movement. The Bhakti movement is going to be right on this border between people primarily being Hindu and people primarily being Muslim. And so it's right on this cultural fault where we see people coming together, kind of rubbing up against each other, culturally speaking, and getting ideas from each other. And so it's this, again, the Bhakti movement was this devotional cult. It was, you can create a personal connection to your God. So here we see this woman. Um, and she's playing her instrument and she feels a sense of inspiration and closeness um, to her god and we see the the impact of Sufism here where we see dancing and music because when you dance and you listen to music you have a heightened sense of emotion um, and that makes you feel closer to God and then in some instances we see people introduce drug use here um, because it gives you an altered state. It's not reality, it's something different and maybe that difference, maybe you're now mentally more able to reach out to God because your reality is changed a little bit. Um, and it seems like you don't understand all the chemical reactions happening in your brain as a result of this drug. For you, it just feels different and maybe you're more connected with your God. And then also the Bhakti movement and some of these devotional cults, they also like the aspect of Islam that takes this immediate salvation. That you don't have to go through all the samsara, the reincarnation, that you can attain salvation today. And so these Hindus, part of this Bhakti movement, will take that and make it part of their faith as well. So we certainly see some, some cultural diffusion here, some rubbing off of Islam onto Hinduism. And then we see, well, what about monotheism? Um, Hinduism says that there's you know, literally thousands of gods, but what if there's only one god? Or what if all the gods, whether it's Vishnu or Shiva or Ganesh, 
what if all of these Hindu gods are really just manifestations, uh, reincarnations of the same god? Um, and certainly there was that part in Hinduism before Islam, but it's going to be, I'm sorry, in Hinduism. Um, but now we're going to see that Hindus think, well, let's think about this again. We have thought about it before, but maybe we should make this a major, more major part of our faith because this is, the Muslims seem to really like one God. It gives them a sense of fulfillment. And so maybe all our gods are really just one God. And so the idea of monotheism, personal connection and spirituality to a God, immediate salvation, Many of things rub off on Hindus in this bhakti movement or devotional cults. India, now, cultural diffusion does not just go one way. It's not like people in India are just being impacted by Islam and not vice versa. And so you have to understand that also certain parts of Indian culture are going to be rubbing off on Islam and Muslims are going to be like, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. We didn't know about this. And so we see that India is going to impact the Islamic world. The first way we see this is in math and science. Um, India has long been a leader in math and science, and when Muslims come in, they're going to be exposed to this. And so the concept of algebra, it's a type of math, of course, you should know there, where you are able to, through an equation, find an unknown quantity. You don't know the answer, but by doing things on both sides of the equation, you can find an answer. Um, and so we see algebra is going to be um, thought about uh, by in Hindus, and then it's going to be transferred to Muslims, and they're going to call it algebra, um, and then eventually it'll get to Europe through trade with the uh, Mediterranean, and so that's how Europeans are going to get exposed to it. But also we see that Hindus also have been experimenting with geometry for a long time, and Muslims, as they build their mosques, and, and the Prophet Muhammad told them to you know, embrace learning, they're going to take that, and geometry is going to be reintroduced into Europe through the Muslims. The Greeks had done geometry, but a lot of that had been lost um, as the Roman and Greek Empire culture declined after the Roman Empire, but now it's going to be re reintroduced. So math and science is going to make its way east to west from India to Europe via the Islamic world. Also, we're going to see that Muslims will borrow the uh, number system of Hindus. Um, we see this, this chart that shows you some original Hindu numbers, and then as they move into the Islamic world, and as they move into medieval Europe. Um, and so they're called Arabic numerals, because even though they start in India, and the Indians invent these number this number system certainly with zero is a placeholder uh that muslims are like wow this zero is a placeholder thing this allows us to help us do much more advanced math and it makes counting easier if we just have to have nine or ten symbols and then we start over again um we don't have to have like the romans where they had uh, you know just uh, an, and you have to have almost an infinite number of symbols to represent things because the romans didn't have zero um and so we're going to see that the muslims take this and then from the Muslims, the Europeans learn about it. And so the Europeans mistakenly think that the Arabs came up with it, hence Arabic numerals. And so we see lots of cultural diffusion here going from South Asia into the Southwest Asia. Next, also the concept of medicine, dissecting bodies. This is something that Hindus and South Asians have been doing for a long time. Um, and in their quest for knowledge, which is the prophet has said is good, uh, in the Islamic world, we'll see that uh, Muslims will learn a lot of their medical sciences um, from India as well. Uh, how about just stuff for fun? Uh, and so not just science and math, but also cultural things like chess. Uh, it's an Indian game. Uh, Muslims will like the strategy involved in it. Um, and then eventually, like in all of these things, the Europeans learn about it through trade and the Crusades and conquest um, with Islam. And of course, the Europeans will change the pieces a little bit to make it look like medieval Europe with pawns like for peasants and, and knights and bishops and kings and queens. But the game originally, of course, starts in India and then moves its way, like all of these things, west into Europe via the Islamic world. Next, we also see that India has long had this concept, as we've talked about in previous lectures, of child brides. Child brides were a way to, one, ensure that the wealth in your family stays in your family because you raise that your wife from her being a girl before she had f first started menstruating, and now that she has, you know that you're the only person to sleep with her because she's been chaperoned. Um, and so this is a way to ensure that whatever wealth you have as a family is passed on to your son, that your wife hasn't been cheating on you. 
Um, in addition, um, it allows for patriarchy to continue. The um, patriarchy, if you are able to raise your um, wife from a very early age, you can train her to be um, and teach her to be a, a wife that is pleasing to you. Um, and so we see that Islam adopts the practice of young brides or child brides from India. Also, the concept of widows not remarrying. Uh, we had talked about sati in the past, where when a husband dies, his wife will be burned um, with him so she can help serve him in the next life. Um, so Islam will take this idea that, yes, we don't want widows remarrying, but we're going to reject the idea of sati. So this is an example of that buffet I've talked to you about. Islam has outlawed the killing of women, whether it's infanticide or later on. And so we reject the sati, but we do like this idea uh, the Muslims would say of women not remarrying because that allows the wealth of the husband to stay in the family. If the patriarch, the oldest male in the family dies, all the wealth doesn't go to his widow and then if she marries to another family, no, that wealth will stay in the family because his widow will not remarry. Um, and so again, here's an example of cultural diffusion that's being tweaked a little bit to meet the needs and the ideas and the morals of a different culture. Next, we see another impact of Islam coming into India is the trade increases even more. Now, in the past, we've talked about in period two that India was the center of maritime trade, Indian Ocean trade, primarily because of its location between East Asia and the rest of the world, but also because of the monsoon winds. The monsoon winds are winds that blow steadily in one direction six months of the year and then turn and blow the other direction. And so this brings people into India and then back out of India to their home ports. And so, of course, being able to understand the monsoon winds is going to help bring people in. But also, in period three, we see that large empires are being reestablished. In China, we're going to see that after the fall of the Han, um, we see Silk Road traffic trade on the Silk Road trade go down. But now we'll talk about in future notes that there's a new empire in China, and so they can protect more of the Silk Roads. It's safe to travel on the Silk Roads, Silk Road trade goes up. Next, we have the Sultanate of Delhi um, in northern India, which can protect part of the Silk Roads. And it's going to be you know, centralizing, and production is going to go up, more artisans, so there's more to trade on the Silk Roads. And then, of course, the Islamic empires we've already talked about, and the shrinking Byzantine Empire. And so we see that there is not that much of the Silk Road that isn't protected, um, and so it's very easy to trade on the Silk Roads. Plus, you have destinations to trade to, large cities and these large empires. So Silk Road trade is going to go up as a result of these large Muslim empires in India. Next I'll talk, let's go back to maritime trade and talk about some of the technological inventions that are going to make uh, maritime trade go up, make it easier and safer to trade on the ocean. First of all, we see the development of the lateen sail. You can see it right here where it says monsoon winds, that boat there, that's called a dhow, um, D-H-O-W, and that is a boat that uses lateen sails. These sails have sails that can pivot, they're not fixed to the mast, and so if the wind is not blowing exactly behind you, it doesn't matter. You can still go in whatever direction you want by tilting the sail since it's angled, um, and that allows you to sail with greater mobility and in directions that even that the wind isn't blowing in that direction you can still sail in that direction. Now these dows or lateen sails were invented, there's some debate about this, they may have been invented in India in period two or in Southwest Asia in period three, but whatever the case we see them more commonly used in period three in the Indian Ocean and so this is going to increase trade on the, merit on the Indian Ocean because it's just easier to get around. Next, the compass was invented in China, and the compass is going to start making its way from merchant to merchant, traveler to traveler, uh, maritime trade, going from China to Southeast Asia, and from Southeast Asia to India, and from India to Southwest Asia, and from Southwest Asia eventually to Europe and Prince Henry the Navigator. And so we see the compass is going to make its way um, across the Indian Ocean. And of course, this makes, makes trade go up because you have less of a, a possibility of getting lost. Let's say it's a very cloudy day, you can't see the sun, uh, it's nighttime, but you can still see which direction is north because the magnetic compass will point north. Um, and so we see that this makes it easier and safer to trade. Same with the astrolabe. The astrolabe is going to be invented uh, by the Greeks, and it helps you measure the angle of the sun, and by that, you can measure how far north or south you are from the equator. This helps you pinpoint your location to a relatively accurate 
um, degree when you use it along with a compass. And the Muslim world is going to trade with the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire hasn't lost the knowledge of the astrolabe, and so they're going to bring what's one of the few rare things that go from west to east, and they're going to bring the idea of the astrolabe into the Indian Ocean, and then people in India are going to use it, people in Southeast Asia and China, and we see that um, trade will go up, maritime trade will go up because of this improvement on being able to find your place on planet Earth. So for all of these reasons, we see trade go up. The only thing I haven't mentioned so far is that China, as we'll get into later, will invent these huge boats called junks. We see a picture on the right-hand side there. And these boats are so big that the volume of trade will go up because the boats are so big. And so more goods can be traded back and forth in at least the eastern part of the Indian Ocean. We don't see junks traveling that much west of the Indian Ocean. That's mostly going to be Dows and African, um, Arab, um, traders dominate that side of the Indian Ocean. So what we see here is that tr trade is done in stages. Even if it's, so if it's on the maritime trade on the Indian Ocean, or if it's Silk Road traffic trade, we see that any of these arrows, you might be a merchant, and your route is to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth from one port to the next. You know that route, you have contacts at both ports, um, and so that makes it easy for you to do this. Very rarely do we see people traveling all the way from one side of a trade network to another, whether it's the Silk Roads or the Indian Ocean trade. Um, but nevertheless, these goods and ideas um, uh, new technology will slowly, gradually make their way from one merchant to another um, as we see increased interaction. Um, so what is the difference between the Silk Roads and the maritime trade? Obviously, one's on land, the Silk Roads. But that's important because if I'm going to trade something on the Silk Roads, I have to carry it or a camel has to carry it. Um, and so I want something that's lightweight, that's also high in value. And so that might be gems, that might be some spices, um, silk. Uh, but if I'm going to trade uh, things that are bulkier and heavier, um, maybe a spice, bigger quantities of spices or cotton, um, then I'm going to start, I'm going to use the maritime trade for that because boats obviously get things way less in the water and so it's, I don't have to carry them. Um, I can let the wind do the job for me. And so we see bulkier items traded um, on the maritime trade, and then we see the luxury, um, high price, low weight items traded on the Silk Roads. Then we talk about, then we see something return that we've talked about under the Roman Empire is that regional specialization reemerges. If you have a really large trade network, you don't have to grow everything you need anymore. You don't have to mine everything. You don't have to produce everything you need to live. You can just focus on the one crop or the one good that you would do really well because your climate is suitable for that crop primarily. Um, and then you can get the rest of the stuff you need from some other region where they can specialize in it. And so we see artisans become more and more specialized. Farmers become more and more specialized. Merchants become more and more specialized. And people will trade or produce kind of one type of good instead of everything they need. Um, this helps quality go up and it also helps price go down because now we're starting to trade some specialized items in bulk. We've already talked about India being a center of all of this trade because if you look at it, it's in the center of all of these major empires. It's got the monsoon winds. Maritime, it's in the center of trade. Silk Roads is in the center of trade. And so India is certainly experiencing a lot of wealth at this time in period three. This is a continuity. We had seen that as trade goes up inside of India in period two, we have these jati, these castes within the caste. And they, instead of being just a merchant as part of the merchant caste, now you're going to be uh, maybe a specialist in uh, precious stones. Um, but then you're going to even more specialize in maybe rubies. Um, and so we see these jati are these super specialized castes that provide for, support for one another. They kind of act as guilds in India. Um, and they um, will just engage in that one kind of trade. Um, maybe they all believe in the same God. Maybe they all convert to Islam. Maybe they all become part of the same devotional cult. Who knows? But it's this idea of specialization and this continuity of the Jati from period two into period three. These, if you want to think of it this way, as Indian guilds. So that is it for part one. We will finish part two, Southern India, when we come back.